Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin David and I am the Deputy Editor of Info Security Magazine. Thank you for joining us for this exciting online summit session. It's official, the metaverse is coming. Now, the company formerly known as Facebook is so committed to the idea it renamed itself Meta to symbolize its drive or its dive into this new online world. Now worryingly, despite the exciting possibilities the metaverse offers, such as a world where people can interact through their avatars or interact with other intelligent beings, seeing each other's pictures or videos, there are substantial concerns around safety, privacy, and security. Could the metaverse provide forums for misinformation and manipulation? How will companies such as Meta handle sensitive information? This star-studded panel discussion will see cybersecurity experts, and other experts of course, explore the challenges around the metaverse, from verification and the dangers of impersonation to biometric information and how private data should be collected and used. Now, let me introduce our panel. So, We've got Zahid Anwar, who is an Associate Professor in Computer Science, Tally Scholar at the North Dakota State University. Um, and his research focuses on cybersecurity policy and innovative cyber defense. And he has authored more than 80 publications in peer-reviewed conferences and journals. Secondly, we have Matthias Madal, who is the CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior and is also a researcher and developer with more than 15 years of hand-on software security experience. He's developed solutions for HP Fortify and his own company, SNC Security. Over his career, Madhu has led multiple application security research projects which have led to commercial products and boasts over 10 patents under his belt. We also have Janai Marankovic, who's an executive director, CISO advisory board for GRC for Intelligent Ecosystems Foundation. Janai, of course, is a multidisciplinary technologist and strategist with 20 years of experience in architecting, building, and security, uh, securing systems at scale. She's designed and operated in real time with the top streaming ecosystems that power live sports, gaming, and entertainment. She's also worked in biomedical manufacturing and laboratory diagnostics, healthcare tech, and robotics in agriculture. And last but not least, we have Charles S. Morgan, who's a partner at McCarthy um, Tetro, national co-leader of McCarthy Tetro Cyber Data Group. And of course, is a nationally recognized leader in cybersecurity, data protection, and technology law. Charles brings deep understanding and disruptive technologies, providing practical advice to keep clients fully, um, to help clients fully support the promise of innovative solutions while managing risk. Now, a few housekeeping points I would like to address before we kickstart the discussion. Now, this Info Security Magazine online summit session qualifies members of ISC Squared, EC Council, and the ISACA to one CPE credit based on a minimum attendance time of 50 minutes. To claim your credit, you will need to log into your Info Security Magazine member account 48 hours after the session has been completed and download your CPE certificate, which will have been generated if you meet the minimum attendance time. You are then responsible for submitting this to your accreditation body. If this is your first time joining our online summit with us, you will have been prompted to enter your CPE number at registration, which enables us to ensure your CPE certificate contains the relevant information for your accreditation body to process. If you did not, your CPE number and if you did not enter your CPE number and would like to collect credits for attending future webinars, please log into your account and add those details now. CPE certificates cannot be created retrospectively. And lastly, for members of other accreditation bodies, every attendee will receive an automated thank you for attending email after the event, which can be provided as proof of attendance to claim your credit yourselves manually. 
This is, of course, at your accreditation body's discretion. And of course, please do submit questions to the palace using the question functionality and be sure to tweet using the hashtag IMOS22. Now, I would like to start with a poll question for our audience. And that question is, what is your main security concern about the metaverse? So the options are impersonation, how personal information will be stored, data privacy, or malware. So that poll is now live. Do get voting. Now let's end the slides and get all of us on camera. Here we go. Um, and I want to kickstart with the following question. So a big security concern um, involves verification in the metaverse. For example, if the metaverse allows people to attend appointments with a doctor or lawyer, surely there will be an authentication process of their real world identity. What are the problems if metaverse providers fail to provide adequate verification? Tanai, can I please go to you first with that question, please? Sure, sure. That's a great question. And thank you. Really honored to be a part of this panel. Um, you know, so I, I want to be clear, um, you know, all providers have some level of identity and access management capabilities that are already built into their metaverse environments. And they mimic real world identity and access. Anybody who's, uh, you know, tried to authenticate into some of these systems, they're the same and uh, they're long complex passwords that change frequently, which makes a really bad experience inside um, of a metaverse environment. Um, but uh, the problems, um, you know, there's, there's a couple, um, you know, first, we always have to go back to like, what is it that we're protecting? You know, what asset are we protecting and what are we concerned about if it gets compromised and what's the attacker's intent? And what attacks will the attacker use in order to compromise that asset? And so we have to be careful here because we're not only protecting like a digital asset, we're also kind of def protecting and defending like a physical security like control and um, or implementing a physical security like control because there's this haptic response that you have in VR. And so because you're bridging the physical, the digital and the biological world, you have to consider the digital person almost as a person when you're designing these identity and access management controls. So it's not just I'm trying to steal uh, uh, money. Um, it's not just uh, that I'm trying to, uh, you know, execute some type of fraud. Um, the digital person um, is an asset that you have to consider as part of that compromise. Um, and so when you're doing your threat models and so forth, you've got to model that out as one of the, uh, you know, as one of the attack models because that that's, you know, that's, you know, some of the issues that you end up having to deal with. So your traditional issues of people trying to steal information and so forth, but you also have to consider the person as an asset um, because they themselves might be attacked. Really good point. Thank you. And I didn't really consider the, the fact that the digital person is an asset. And that's a very um, good point. Uh, Charles, can I also go to you on the topic of verification and what uh, medical sure. providers need to do to make sure they're doing it right? Sure. Um, so just by way of background, I'm, I'm sort of the, the lawyer on the panel as opposed to the security expert. Um, and so let me let me start by saying, you know, if I go back to the, the beginning of the Internet, you know, there was a concern about are there no laws that will apply on the Internet? And and and, you know, what became very clear very quickly is that the Internet is not a no law land. It'll be the same thing with uh, the metaverse. Um, and the examples that you have pointed out in particularly are important. You talk about a doctor or a lawyer or banking. These are regulated industries. And so no matter what the user interface is and, and the, you know, the user experience is going to be a real challenge. Getting consents in a, in a way that feels fluid is going to be a technical challenge and a ergonomic challenge. But a regulated industry, first of all, you can't 
practice law unless you're a lawyer. You can't be a doctor and provide uh, health services unless you are, you know, have the appropriate uh, experience and, and authorization. And all of these industries that you've mentioned have very important, um, you know, know your client rules. Um, so you, you, you can't start to offer the service to somebody in these regulated industries unless you've established what their identity is. These are not new issues uh, where, you know, online banking has been around for a long time. Uh, the, the, there's a, a, absolutely an increased uh, use in virtual health care. But I can tell you that somebody doesn't just say, hey, I'm going to put up my uh, a shingle and start offering virtual health care services. These are heavily regulated. So once you enter, so, you know, JP Morgan has opened up a, a, a bank in, a, you know, the Met, Metajuku Mall. Once you're in the bank, they're going to be going through the same kind of process of ensuring that they know who you are and only offering the services that they are allowed to offer you based on the level of sophistication that you are as an investor. I mean, all the rules will continue to, to, to apply. And so I think, you know, in a nutshell, I think there are going to be some ergonomic issues about how do I make this sort of consent process and uh, identification process feel fluid but the basic regulatory requirements, especially when you're talking about collection of biometric information, which is even more regulated, and notions of express consent, which are you know, universal in all privacy laws around the world, they are going to remain bedrock. Charles, if I may pick up on, on what you've just mentioned, um, I, I actually see an opportunity as well where um, stuff can be verified more easily um, in the metaverse than um, in the physical world. Um, right now, if, if, if you need advice and you go to a lawyer, quite often you do not go through you know, a hefty check to figure out if that lawyer does have all the certification and everything that is needed to, to be a lawyer. While I, I do think if, if this is done right, um, a, a digital verification, if it actually works, um, will go through that. And if you consult with a lawyer, um, in, in a virtual environment, all these checks can be made digital and it, it can actually, you know, be an improvement to where we are today. Um, and I always see the metaverse as an extension of, of, of real life. So I think that that can be an opportunity to do better than, than in the real world. Um, and maybe one thing to, to add um, to, to something that uh, Janai was mentioning is, is around authentication. Um, one thing I see is, is um, I'm, I'm Belgian, and, and I do think um, where, where I live, um, there, there's, there's a notion to authenticate yourself, and, and it actually works quite well. The way you authenticate um, to get information from, from the state and from the government and to access your healthcare package and everything like that actually works really well. The problem I see is I, I have no idea how that works in, in the UK or in France and or, or anywhere else. So I, I know for us it works, but how that translates to a, a global perspective, do we need to have an individual perspective or a global perspective in, in that sense? That to me is, is pretty challenging. Before I go over to Zahid, um, tonight, do you have any um, comments? No, I, I absolutely ag agree. I, I think, you know, um, again, I'm going to go a little bit back towards that physical security because there's this area that's emerging called it used to be converged security where you had physical, digital and um, crisis all converging. And in metaverse, you're seeing it converging, you know, so I may go into your digital bank for the purpose of, you know, having some type of transaction. But again, because there's a haptic response, somebody can come in and hit me um, and I feel like I'm getting hit. And so what ends up happening is, is that there's, you know, uh, you have to consider physical security controls as part of that, that environment. Um, and digital security people aren't necessarily equipped to do that. And so I, I do, as, as we're kind of going through all of these worlds, we have to consider physical security implications in the metaverse, um, because it's just like you were saying, um, it is a reflection of what's going on in the physical world. It's an extension of it. 
Fantastic. And Zahid, what are your thoughts around um, verification, particularly what um, ways metaverse providers should be doing proper um, verification? You're on mute. Oh, I didn't think we can hear you. Are you on mute? I'm sorry, had the mute on. Uh, so I agree with my colleagues, uh, like particularly Charles mentioned that these are not new problems. Right? So what happens when you are unable to verify that that urgent looking email on your phone um, is um, supposedly from your bank uh, is, uh, you know, is indeed from your bank or not. So you end up clicking on the link, you know, your credentials, your identity gets stolen, probably along with your money. Uh, it's the same kinds of problems that you'll see in the metaverse. The main difference is being uh, that it may happen a lot more often um, because of these uh, um, increased uh, sensory modalities like visual, auditory, uh, olfactory, like Jin I mentioned, you know, um, uh, there's the haptic uh, response there. And then there's a lot more than uh, that these attackers can steal, right, or they could tamper with. Uh, we are already seeing uh, hackers uh, stealing your appearance, you know, the digital twins problem, right? Uh, the metaverse companies are creating all these deep fakes of famous actors without explicitly gaining their consent. Uh, we are seeing incidents with apps like uh, VR chat, you know, where there's poor verif age verification checks. Uh, and then hackers can create these fake profiles, they can mix freely with minors, you can coax them for their personal information. Uh, and then other than humans, we are also seeing uh, places, right, and things like, uh, uh, you know, guerrilla artists making modifications to all these historical places like the Pollock Gallery at the New York Museum of Modern Art, you know, putting in their own painting instead of the, the actual ones in the museum. There are other enthusiasts that are uh, adding stolen paintings back <clears throat> into the uh, the Gartner Museum in Boston. <laughs> right? yeah. So it's, it's important to prove that uh, you are who you are uh, instead of another person. Uh, and uh, going to back to your uh, question is what should we be doing? I think um, uh, these solutions because, um, you know, we are, uh, this is uncharted territory and we have uh, a lot more uh, abilities with this technology. So as these authentication verification problems arise, so does uh, more or interesting, uh, more meaningful ways of doing verification. Uh, so for example, we are seeing a lot of these very, uh, a nice uh, biometric identification uh, authentication mechanisms coming up. There's a lot of companies that are using different parts of your body uh, to be able to do things like we, we used to do with two-factor authentication with our phones. Yeah, Zahid, you actually bring up a really good point in terms of the amount of biological information that, uh, that, that gets cast off that can be leveraged for authentication. And, um, you know, there's a concept, it's called an adaptive cognitive profile, where it's where we're constantly yeah, <laughs> harvesting different biological or cognitive attributes that we can use for authentication. And so when and modulate it. Uh, and that makes it a little bit more difficult for the attacker to attempt to impersonate you because they don't necessarily know what attribute we're going to check for. And so uh, in a metaverse environment, and remember, metaverse also interacts with uh, with internet, other internet-based systems. There's a lot of different you know, pieces of information that we can use to collect about you to use to authenticate you. Um, regardless of the amount of privacy issues. <laughs> well, I was going to say, if I could just jump in on this point, because I, you know, there's the security perspective, but there's also the regulatory perspective. And I, I just think it's really important for our listeners, our audience to understand that when you're starting to think about, um, you know, using biometrics for authentication, which, you know, may be a, a very good thing to do, you, you can't ignore the fact that biometric, the collection and use of biometric information is heavily regulated. And I'll give you know, a simple example uh, taken from Canada. Uh, a shopping mall uh, wanted to get a sense of 
who was a, t- a physical, a real shopping mall, who wanted to get a sense of um, uh, uh, attributes of people who were shopping in the mall. So when you went to the uh, store guide on the screen, there would be a video taken of the people in front of you and using anonymous um, uh, video analytics, that, that video image would say, oh, this is a 42-year-old uh, male. Probably that person wants to go here or something like that. So just really basic, basic information about user profiles, basically. Uh, much less information that you would typically get in an online universe where, where you know everything about <laughs> who's, who's in your shopping mall and you're watching every, you know, what, what they're hovering over. But in Canada, the, the Privacy Commissioner deemed that illegal um, because it was a collection of biometric facial recognition without consent. And the, the, the biome- collection of, of biometric in- information requires express consent. And how do you give express consent in those contexts? You know, if you're just walking across the screen, you're hardly going to give express consent. So I don't want to be a downer, but I just want to make it very clear that companies will get run into a lot of trouble quite quickly if they're not thinking right from the start there's some compliance issues i've got to i've got to work through yes i think um, you and i and i we when we spoke about this prior to this webinar it's hard to like it's curious to know exactly what biometric information will be taken as the metaverse um, expands as devices become more and more sophisticated whether that be uh, fingerprints whether that be eye scanning or height or anything else so it'll be very interesting um, and definitely uh, an issue of watch this space um, i would like to bring back the the poll question and just look at the results of that first poll question so as a reminder what is your the your main security concern about the metaverse. Now, 24% of you have picked uh, impersonation, 21% just changed uh, how personal information will be stored, 48% of you picked data privacy, and 6% of, of you picked malware. Now I want to launch the second poll of the session, which is how safe would you feel in the metaverse? Very unsafe, slightly unsafe, somewhat safe, safe or unsure. So that poll is now live. Do get voting. And of course, if you have questions for us, do use the, uh, the question feature as well. So the next question I would like to focus on would be, um, which kind of can covers some of the things that have been discussed uh, thus far, which is like, there are no clear guidelines available to protect data in the metaverse. Now, given the vast amount of uh, sensitive data and other types of data that will be uh, handled in the metaverse, what kind of guidelines do you think would be necessary to keep uh, our data secure? Um, Matthias, can we go to you first on that question, please? Sure. Um, interesting question, right? And I think we, we should definitely learn from the past and where it happens elsewhere. Um, and, and quite often we, we learn on the go. If, if you look at Facebook back in the day, there was no regulation. There was, there was no, nothing out there. They, they tried to do the good thing. You know, they, they thought about, hey, how can we store something in a secure way? What do we expose? What do we not expose? What is private? What is public? And so on and so forth. So on the go, they, they learned a lot of lessons, sometimes the hard way. Um, so I really hope that these lessons can be taken um, into the, the new experience that, that we're creating. That being said, I'm, I'm actually, I, I think we will figure that out, to be honest. I think we will figure that out. Yes, there's, there's, there's plenty of things to go through and, and to think about, but we will figure it out because we have a lot of examples. Yes, there are new angles. There are uh, new ways of handling data, and we will also learn on the go. The one thing that I'm a little bit more concerned about is even if we know what we want to protect and how to handle it, it still needs to be implemented. It still needs to be developed by by um, software engineers, and and that's where you know where it becomes really interesting. Even let's say we figure this out 100%. We know exactly what is private, what is public, how we are going to handle data. 
that does not mean it will be implemented in that particular way. That does not mean everything will work the way we think it's going to work. There's going to be plenty of problems out there. And some of these problems will lead to more exposure of data. So to me, um, a, a very real concern to me is, is making sure that um, developers are up to speed, that developers are able to implement the way we see this, the way um, regulation comes in, the way we want this metaverse to be implemented. And that, of course, requires a lot of people. Um, let's be honest, there's already a shortage in developers. Um, we want to do more than what we can do today. Everybody is scrambling for developers. Everybody's looking for, for good developers. Um, and, and even harder is to find developers that, um, you know, are upskilled and are able to nail exactly what we want to do into, into the metaverse. So that's how I look at, at the problem of, of data and privacy and how it relates to the implementation of it. Fantastic. Yeah, I've been learning from the past, I mean, uh, the irrelevant um, with certain companies and implementation. Um, absolutely. Very interesting. Cyber skills gap, something that Info Security Magazine is definitely not averse to uh, focusing on, given how it's wide scale it is. Um, Zahid, can I go to you also on that question um, regarding, just a quick reminder, um, Made. What are the, your? Um, what do you think would be necessary to keep uh, data secure? What what should providers, uh, metaverse providers, be, be thinking about when they're thinking about the guidelines? Super interesting question. Based on the polls that we you just read out, you know, privacy seems to be one of the biggest uh, uh, things that our viewers have on uh, on their uh, minds about this. And I agree with uh, Matt, uh, he mentioned uh, that we should learn from history. So, uh, you know, even outside the metaverse, you know, data privacy will be the most important issue in the next decade, right? Uh, and consumers will only uh, trust businesses that are transparent about what they collect up on them and, you know, that they collect the bare minimum that they need to provide the functionality and services. Uh, with regards to uh, guidelines, there are, uh, I, I, do worth, uh, I would like to mention the Extended Reality Safety Initiative. This is a privacy framework. It's a good place to start a uh, community-driven uh, set of guidelines about data privacy protections and safety. Uh, it draws uh, upon uh, the, uh, the existing laws like the uh, General Data Protection Regulations, uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST, uh, guidance, FERPA, uh, COPA from, uh, you know, regards to children's privacy and all these other evolving laws. Uh, but you are right in that there is a lack of clarity uh, regarding some key questions here. So, uh, for example, uh, you know, like Charles had mentioned, uh, the, uh, things like banks and uh, uh, healthcare, right? So the way they do, they approach, uh, and, uh, you know, their data privacy is they they classify things. So they they uh, and we need to do the same. So there is a need to classify the data sensitivity, you know, the, uh, that's produced in the metaverse. We need to determine labels, uh, and then we need to establish who's responsible, right? Uh, if a personal's uh, a person's personal data is stolen and then, or it's misused while they are in the metaverse, then who's really responsible for it? Uh, you know, there's a data sharing agreements. Uh, we need to establish those between the different industries. We need to establish boundaries uh, between uh, data um, in, in your real life versus your immersive life. So there's a lot of open challenges uh, today. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, towards the end of this session, we'll be focusing quite um, a lot on some of the issues that you raise, and I think you know, IT people will be thinking, okay, we're interested in the metaverse. What should our response be? Um, how can we properly train people um, to, to deal with this? Let alone just on the provider side, but also the people using it as well. So, um, I never really thought about classifying data. Uh, 
sensitivity like that. That's a very interesting point. Charles, I saw you kind of nodding um, and let you had some, some points to, to, to raise. So what are your thoughts on this topic? Well, I, I guess I would start by pushing back on this idea that there are no clear guidelines available uh, to protect data in the metaverse. Um, there are very clear uh, data protection principles and guidelines and laws uh, that, that apply to the metaverse in the same way they, they've been applying to you know, data collection on the internet or even in person. Um, so f first of all, you know, GDPR, that, uh, which was mentioned, uh, that in terms of data protection laws and principles about uh, the identification of purposes before you collect information, getting express consent before you collect information, limited collection, which says that you, and data minimization about you know only collecting the personal information that you need in order to provide the service that is itself uh, legitimate, limited retention. These are all privacy principles that have a data protection um, implication to them. You, you're less likely to uh, have a, you know, a massive privacy breach if you're, if you're you know, limiting the collection to the information that you need. Um, and you know, NIST framework, the ISO, there's, there's all kinds of security frameworks that again, um, uh, that are, that are going to be relevant. I guess what I would say a couple of things that, that are sort of just reinfor reinforced in the, in the metaverse um, that, that we're going to see uh, as being uh, b bigger issues. One is uh, data location issues and, and data cross-border data transfer. Uh, cross-border data transfer issues now are already problematic. There, you, know, you have to understand, first of all, you have to put in place uh, you have to do, assess the adequacy of the data protection laws of the regime that you're transferring data to. And transfers of personal data from Europe, for instance, to the United States is very complicated. I'm not going to get into the details, but uh, there, there you know, rules around privacy shield and, and whether the laws of the United States are adequate to protect the personal information of uh, EU data subjects. In the metaverse, you know, the, the idea is fluidity, right? You want this data to flow in all directions uh, and, and without constraint. But the data protection laws are going to insist on those constraints and borders are getting thicker. So I think international data flow is going to be even more complex. The other thing that I would uh, focus on is, is vendor management. And one of the core principles that uh, was mentioned earlier is accountability. Who's responsible? Who's responsible for this data? If something goes wrong, if there's if there's an incident that leads to a data, um, it, well, either an unauthorized use by the data collector of that data, you know, using it for an inappropriate purpose or a disclosure that is inappropriate, or some kind of hack or you know a, a cyber incident, who is responsible? And so, uh, you know, one of the core principles of privacy law is this notion of of accountability and the controller of the data remains responsible for that data even when it's in the hands of a processor, so a third party that's processing it on your behalf. Contractually, you're going to, I mean, this is <laughs> a lot of work for lawyers, I can assure you. Uh, getting those uh, data protection agreements or data protection addendum in, in place to, to understand that data flow, understand the chain of responsibility, address issues of limitation of liability, that whole vendor management component is going to become even more important. And, and contracts are going to insist on things like, uh, you know, least privilege access principles and data minimization and limited retention. All these things are, and plus, very clear standards of data security. Um, I, I think we're, that, that, you know, these will be contractually imposed, or they should be. The, the basic point is going to be privacy and security by design. And you do that technologically, and you do that contractually. Fantastic point. Thank you so much for that, Charles. Um, when you talk about international data as well, and one of the things that came to my mind would be what happens if you have different types of um, VR devices um, taking different types of biometric information um, and what that might mean with respect to storage. If you've got a particular 
um, if the bank was mentioned and you have different kind of cross platforms, what implications will that have, um, let alone the different international factors that you mentioned as well? So really, really good points. Um, Janai, can I come to you on that question again with respect to um, data and how, to, uh, how vendors should be pop, uh, properly safeguarding that data? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, I, I would, uh, a couple of things. Um, one is, uh, I think there's got to be more discussion about what constitutes biological information or biometric information or PII um, inside uh, the, the metaverse. You know, so is my avatar PII? Um, is uh, a movement of that avatar PII? Uh, is a wink a PII, right? You know, and all of those, like a wink is a, con you know, is me telling someone how I feel. So that's an emotion. So that's digitized. Is that PII? And so, um, you know, uh, one of the, the problems on the security side is that, you know, we have to map out the data and then apply the appropriate protective and detective controls every single place where that piece of information is stored, transmitted, processed, or accessed. And if we don't understand that that information is classified as PII, then we may not apply all of the appropriate security controls to it. So at the key, you know, we've got a real big governance, data governance problem and, and how we classify and categorize all of this information. So the, again, I keep uh, harping on this, this intersection between the physical and the, and, um, the metaverse, but it's, it's true. There's a lot of things that we aren't responsible for classifying in the digital world because it's in the physical world. Somebody else handles that. You know, but now that, you know, it's in the metaverse, a lot of those things, you know, how is it classified? You know, so I think uh, it, it uh, obviously for the G GRC and legal professionals, this is a big deal on the security side. Um, we're going to miss the boat if it's not classified appropriately at the onset. Uh, you know, so yeah, I, I, I think there's that. I think also there's really understanding that with all of this information that we're collecting, uh, you know, what's the business model and the purpose of the application itself. You know, so it goes back to uh, Charles, what you were saying, if we're collecting a lot of information and this is a tennis game, you know, and it's, and it's considered biometric information, something where the risks are really low, the compliance requirements are going to be just overwhelming, you know, so it goes back to minimization and making sure that you're only collecting the information that you absolutely need, uh, you know, because this could become, you know, a, a very big deal. Uh, multiple states have laws now that deal with uh, bio, uh, biometric data and, you know, almost every country has their own perception. And so it, this is a big deal um, and it's really complex. And so you got to be really, really careful as we're going forward here. On the topic of data classification, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of pressure from metaverse providers to ensure that once you have that initial verification, you should be able to do various things on the metaverse relatively easily. So if I were to walk down the high street and I go to a bank, of course, I need, to, I need additional verification. But I'm guessing there might be a lot of pressure um, from metaverse providers to ensure that if there's a robust initial verification, you should be able to kind of relatively easily enjoy um, banking on the metaverse and all these other things, which would make the, possibly make the topic of um, data classification even more severe, I'm guessing. Yeah, if I'm walking down the street in the physical world and a video camera picks me up, there's a whole bunch of laws and requirements around how that video is, is treated. If I am, my avatar is walking down a virtual street and that is recorded, what is that? It, am, am I obligated to treat that the exact same way as I would, you know, video um, in the physical world? And on the security side, if I do, then there's a whole bunch of controls now, security controls that I have to apply, um, you know, on top of everything to just that virtual avatar walking down the virtual street. Fantastic. Okay. Um, I'm aware of the fact that well, we've got 20 minutes or so left. So I want to jump onto the next topic. Um, again, this is going to maybe going down a more dark route. Um, so currently no security framework is available to protect uh, the metaverse from, from malware. Now, as this technology is new, experts warn that security standards should be evolved to protect the metaverse from malware. Uh, how might this be uh, achieved? Um, Zahid, can I please go to you first on that question? 
and uh, yes, I, I agree that since it's just such a new area, there's not a whole lot of uh, information about these different malwares uh, that would plague uh, this uh, realm. Uh, but uh, we can learn from what we know uh, and we've seen already. So think of uh, the system that powers the metaverse as essentially a very elaborate cyber physical system. There's sensors, there's controllers, there's communication going on, there's the cloud. And so we can apply some of the same principles that we uh, used for, or at least uh, we are looking to apply for the Internet of Things, for example, devices, uh, keeping them safe from malicious software. Uh, so I would uh, suggest, for, well, for developers, that they should keep abreast of the latest patches, you know, um, for the vulnerabilities. Uh, for example, for uh, the Unity 3D engine that uh, many apps use to, uh, as their basis, maintains a very up-to-date uh, list of vulnerabilities on its website. Uh, we should be using secure coding practices, uh, making use of good uh, bug bounty programs um, to see if uh, people can find bugs in our systems. For the users, I would uh, suggest, um, you know, as always, changing all your default passwords uh, keep your software patched, keep the operating system. Uh, Oculus is the uh, one of the popular ones. Um, those need to be kept up to date. Uh, use private networks because there's going to be a lot of uh, new, uh, communication uh, with these systems. Uh, one of the uh, problems that we are seeing with some of the proof of concept malware is coming out is under, uh, people not understanding uh, the problems with side loading unofficial apps because that can put you at risk um, because uh, if you use something from the marketplace then those are verified uh, more or less uh, uh, they're safer to use. Uh, there are some uh, new <clears throat> features that uh, Metaverse provides. So you have these multi-application spatial computing uh, kind of applications where users can place their virtual applications, their devices, cameras in someone else's virtual settings. And so this can uh, lead to severe privacy breaches, uh, malware. Uh, it could... Um, you know, easily ha uh, allow adversaries to launch these new kinds of attack, uh, attacks. And then again, we need to understand uh, that these compromised sensors, <clears throat> they may be gathering biometrics, right? You have uh, eye scanning going on. Uh, the malware could be gaze tracking you. <clears throat> it could be looking at your heart rate, excuse me. Uh, it could be rec trying to recognize your gestures, your user movements, your physical characteristics, your body movements. Um, and so, uh, you know, just follow the rules that you normally work with, uh, you know, uh, turn off your, uh, the, uh, put on the lid on your webcam uh, when you are not using it and uh, things that, uh, uh, you know, malware could do without you knowing about it. Fantastic. It makes me think to myself, um, as Metaverse devices, Oculus Quest advance, will they be tantamount to like a modern laptop, for example, in which the case we could use, be using like an EDR, for example. And in my phone, for example, right now I can have software on my phone that will scan um, for certain things, Makes you wonder whether there will be an app in the future on the Oculus Marketplace that's like an antivirus or some other um, known um, cybersecurity product. So yeah, very, very interesting points. Thank you so much for that. Um, Matthias, can we please go to, to you on the topic of, of malware in the metaverse? Absolutely. And, and Zahid, you made a couple of really good points over there around frameworks and, and software. Um, the good part is, well, there's already plenty of software out there that we can use uh, and continue to use. The bad part is we're using software from back in the day, which already has problems. So, you know, we're not starting from scratch. We're building on, on top of previous stuff, which we hope is secure. And we all know, um, take Logshell, for example, we know that sometimes, you know, that, that goes south. Um, so the good part is we're, we, we have already something, so we can quickly spin something up. We can make headways fast, 
um, with this, this new technology, this new experience. The bad part is, you know, there's still stuff in the old days that we got wrong that is going to bite us back um, days from now, months from now, maybe years from now. Um, Zahid, you brought, brought up a couple of really good points. Um, there is software out there that can help um, developers in writing secure software. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's scanners out there, there's penetration testers out there, and we will all need that. You know, uh, with this new technology, nothing is going to go away. It's only going to increase. Um, if if we, we do more things online, um, more information will be added to the, to the metaverse um, from movement, from biometrics, everything. Um, so the, the, the level of security will only increase, which means that the robustness of our software only has to be better. Um, so, so that being said, I think um, a, a critical component over here is making sure um, that that developers are uplifted and are able to do the right thing, that they're able to be guided in in, in writing these uh, the, these secure pieces of, of software. Um, so, so with that malware wise, um, well, quite often what we see even today is that that. I would like to say silly mistakes um, that are introduced in the code can ha actually have a huge effect um, on what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so from a malware perspective, quite often it's not rocket science. It's not something, you know, um, extremely brilliant and putting a hundred things together. Quite often it's, it's very simple, silly mistakes. So, so definitely my recommendation would be to go with um, frameworks that are out for a long, long time, that are hardened, that are innovative, that people still maintain, that that is um, still upgraded, updated on a on a on a daily basis, making sure that we're using something that that is known to be robust. So if if we do that, you know, I think we 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 can definitely make a dent and we can produce something where people feel safe, you know, where people can move around and and do transactions and and behave where they say, okay, I'm I I have a safe environment over here. But I, you know. I'll be honest, it's not going to be easy and mistakes will be made along the way, but at least there's stuff out there that can be used um, to make it as robust as possible. Fantastic. Yeah, I think we've had a couple of articles on the topic of the metaverse already and frameworks, making sure you pick a trial and um, tried and tested framework seem to be um, yeah, a best practice, I think, I can, I can hear people say quite often. Um, Janai, can I get, go to you on that question again? So, metaverse, sure. uh, malware. What it depends on where the malware resides. Uh, you know, so 100% uh, the vendors, especially because there's an opportunity to make money, right? Um, vendors are going to, uh, you know, create uh, anti-malware protection for endpoint devices. So. 100% that that, you know, that's ultimately going to occur, uh, you know, but malware happens all over the place, right? You know, so in the ecosystems, in the metaverse platforms, those, those applications we're entering, um, you know, the if the providers themselves haven't implemented the appropriate anti-malware protection, um, uh, or so why don't we just say overall security controls, then those environments themselves can be infected. And what that malware does all depends on what happens in that environment, in that ecosystem. You know, so, uh, uh, you know, is the purpose of the malware uh, to, uh, you, you know, attempt to extort information out of you? Is the purpose of the malware to intercept uh, uh, transactions, monetary transactions? What, what's the purpose? Am, am I compromising? Uh, am I putting malware in that environment so that I can uh, harvest bitcoins? Uh, you know, so the, the same types of, uh, you know, infections and attacks that we see in the, in, um, the digital world, what we will see in, in the metaverse. What could be kind of interesting is, um, you know, do we consider a malicious avatar malware as an example? You know, so right now you've got uh, AI uh, that is creating artificial people. Uh, and so if I am creating an artificial person for the purpose of, uh, you know, whatever, try, again, trying to social engineer information out of you, is that malicious artificial person, you know, consider malicious code, you know, so I, I think as the metaverse evolves, what we what we classify as malware may end up changing. 
fantastic points. Thank you. Um, Charles, I'm very aware of the fact that it was a very uh, cybersecurity um, focused question. But I want to go to our next question now uh, before you win. Before I do that, though, I just want to launch our final poll of the, of the session. So again, just to remind people of the last poll, just how safe would you feel in the metaverse? 21% uh, of you said you feel very unsafe. 38% slightly unsafe, 24% of big somewhat safe, 0% of you have, are currently feeling safe about the metaverse, and 15% are feeling uh, unsure. So based on this conversation, I think that perhaps explains why 0% uh, of you are safe when you think about the metaverse. So to launch our final poll of this session, which is, will you be joining the, the metaverse. Um, yes, maybe, no, unsure. I'm pretty <laughs> confident that the contributions today will have swayed you either way. So that poll is now live. So I'm going to bring us back on camera. Um, and in fact, the organizations, I'm sure, watching this will be thinking, if a breach occurs inside the metaverse, what should a proper security response be? Um, what would you say to that? Charles, can I get to you first on that question? Well, re response to cyber incident is, is always a mix of security uh, responses and, and legal responses. Um, you know, from a security uh, perspective, you try to, at first, uh, stop the bleeding, contain, contain the incident, figure out forensics, you know, figure out what happened um, and, and, and then remediate the, the, the issue as soon as possible. Uh, from a regulatory legal perspective, um, there's a series of things and steps that, that always occur. First of all, you want to make sure all, of, all companies should have an incident response plan that's already been set up in advance so that you know who's on the team, who's going to respond, and who are the vendors, third party, who, you know, what law firm are you going to bring in, what forensics firm will you bring in, and maybe you have relationships that are already set up, even with a, a friend, potentially a call center. From a legal perspective, um, almost immediately, there are some breach notification requirements that you have to have and some security incident logging requirements. These are required by law. And so uh, one of the things that you need to determine is what jurisdictions are involved. And it, I mean, is there a way to isolate, um, uh, did, did this incident occur in, in one jurisdiction or all? Are the people that are affected, you know, based in, in, in Europe, in, in the United States, in Canada, in China? And depending on the response to that, your legal responsibility in terms of uh, notifying regulatory authorities, privacy data protection authorities, uh, or the state AG or, or whoever may be required to, to receive a breach notification uh, uh, mailing um, will vary. You may have, if there's a the test in Canada and it's similar around the world, if there's a real risk of significant harm to an individual as a result of the breach, you do have to make these notifications. Um, Second thing is that um, it, it, all incidents will have to be logged. There have been multiple uh, legal frameworks around the world require uh, that certain basic information, uh, even if there isn't a real risk of significant harm, you still have to log it and you have to track that. And, and data protection authorities may have access to those logs, so you have to think about how you're collecting that information. Uh, you want to do it responsibly, but you also don't want to put yourself make yourself subject to unnecessary uh, legal jeopardy. Uh, but I would say, you know, one of them, I'm not just preaching for my parish, bringing a legal advisor is important um, because right from the beginning, you want to have a breach coach that is master of ceremony, that's directing that response and making sure that as a, as a company, um, you're going to benefit from the solicitor client privilege. Uh, there are some facts that you want to share and you have to share uh, legally with, with the privacy commissioner, but there are other details that you want to uh, ensure is protected by um, uh, the, 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 this notion of solicitor-client privilege so that you can speak openly about what happened. You can speak about your, your vulnerabilities. You can speak about ooh, what, what maybe went wrong. But that, that those same details are not necessarily, you know, exhibit A in the class action lawsuit that's brought against you. So bringing in 
a legal advisor almost immediately in the event of a, of a cyber incident is, is important. And so, I, again, I, I, I don't want to sort of repeat myself and pretend that there's nothing new about the metaverse. There's a lot that's new about the metaverse. But from, a, from an incident response perspective and from a legal perspective, the same reflexes that companies should already have should inform their approach to an incident response. And I would just say this is an area where you've got added layers of complexity and those issues of cross-border data flow and who's accountable, who's responsible, uh, vendor management. You know, often these incidents occur because, not because the company itself, but because one of its service providers has not put in place adequate security. So look at your contract. What, did you have proper contractual controls to impose and address that risk allocation issue properly? Uh, these, these will only become uh, more critical in, in, the, in the metaverse. Yeah, I mean, it just shows you just how important focusing on just legal implications are when you take into account the metaverse and moving forward and how to properly, as you say, um, set up a effective incident response. Um, Zaihi, can I go to you on that question? What should companies do if and when a breach occurs mm -hmm. in the metaverse? Yes, so uh, Charles pretty much covered the data breach part and the legal part. So I just want to add, uh, so he, he talked about, you know, um, patching uh, the vulnerabilities, scoring your, uh, securing your network now. Um, and so um, we should be changing our access codes. Uh, and then he talked about documenting everything you can. Uh, that's important for the forensics. I would say also uh, to add to that, uh, we should transfer, you know, any remaining assets we have. So for example, if our NFTs get um, breached, then we should uh, uh, copy them over to a secondary wallet for safekeeping purposes. Uh, we should also contact uh, uh, marketplaces where uh, someone could go and uh, sell uh, this stuff because, you know, with the traditional internet, this stuff goes to the dark web. Um, but inside the metaverse, there's these marketplaces that, that people would, um, hackers would generally go to with your data. Uh, um, Charles talked about uh, regulations in Canada, and uh, we have uh, similar ones in the states, uh, and it is important to comply with those. Uh, I would also suggest uh, becoming a member of some kind of information sharing uh, and analysis center. Uh, these are these ISACs, um, different uh, industries have their own. There's one for financial, FS ISAC, uh, there's one for health. And so you should share uh, the breach information as much as you can uh, so that other people, uh, may, other organizations may better protect themselves. Uh, I would say um, as an organization, designate a well-informed point person in your organization. Uh, and to provide some consistent information to your customers uh, uh, about uh, what you're doing, uh, about um, the breach that has happened, you know, their, their data getting stolen. And then I also uh, think that that's the data breach side, right? What about privacy breaches? Uh, those uh, um, are going to be big too, right? And uh, organizations are interestingly actually working on uh, some innovative ways to deal with privacy breaches uh, in the metaverse so for example you know gaming is the one of the big industries uh, and that started out with and uh, this goes back to uh, Janai's uh, comment she made a really interesting comment about uh, our uh, uh, AI driven uh, avatars considered malware and I would jump on that and say yeah I mean definitely we've seen bots in on the internet right uh, uh, and now these are just equivalent uh, versions in the metaverse and so um, there's different uh, uh, companies like Horizon Worlds uh, has come up with these uh, very interesting personal uh, boundary tools so they create these uh, ring of this this ring of space around avatars uh, to keep uh, um, these intruders out. 
They're, they have these hand vanishing tools where, um, you know, you can protect uh, against anti, uh, they're these anti harassment tools basically. Uh, Second Life has um, provided this feature where you can sit down uh, so that uh, other people uh, could, uh, can't assault you in, in, in world. And then there's all these other research ideas that are uh, coming up. So for example, creating a private copy of um, a virtual store front, right? If you don't want to be observed uh, shopping for virtual underwear, uh, then you make a private copy of that. So if someone can't look over your shoulder, um, you know, uh, if you are uh, feeling like hanging out, you've uh, created a, a nice pool site for yourself, but there's a lot of other avatars there uh, looking over your shoulder, then uh, you can, um, companies are looking at creating the swarm of clones of, uh, of your avatar. So uh, it's hard to figure out who's the actual one. And there's other things like teleportation and there's uh, disguising and visibility. Uh, so yeah, those are my two cents about reaches. Fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to um, wrap things up there because you know, I think we need kind of two hours really to be to focusing on all these amazing topics. So um, I just want to bring up the, the, the last uh, result of the, the poll, uh, the last poll result, rather. Uh, will you be doing the metaverse? So 11% yes, 38 maybe, 25 no, and 25 unsure. So very, very interesting results there. Um, let's end it there. Thank you, uh, Charles, Zahid, Tayas, and Jemai for joining me on this very fascinating topic. To our audience, thank you so much for all your votes. Do tune in to the next um, online summer session. And the session will be on demand, so you can always watch it again. And we will now wrap it up. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very thank much. You. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.